This is the Influencer Entrepreneurs Podcast with Jenny Melrose, where I strategize with business owners on how to grow and scale their businesses to hit their income goals. This is episode 196 of the Influencer Entrepreneurs Podcast with Jenny Melrose. Today, we're going to be talking about how to find your niche in business with Robin Graham and making sure that I want all of my bloggers that are listening and influencers, I am going to call you out in this episode. I'm not going to hold back. I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm thinking and how I think that understanding how to narrow your niche is so important for all of you. Too many times I'm working with clients that can't even tell me their elevator pitch because they think that they have to attract all the people. So they'll tell me, oh, I create healthy recipes. That's not enough. And then I have my other clients who will come to me and say they want to create a product or service because they've gotten smart and realize they need to diversify their income. But now they're not used to creating a product or service. And they're so used to just putting out content that's so broad that niching down to that product or service, they don't understand that they need to really communicate and walk their audience into that new product or service. So Robin and I are really going to dive into this. This is an important episode. If you are looking to really start treating your business like a business, niching down is a huge piece of it. All right, you guys, let's dive in. Hi, Robin. How are you? Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Jenny. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, I am so excited to dive into this. Before we get started, though, can you introduce yourself and your business to my audience? Sure. My name is Robin Graham, and I'm a brand strategist and personal branding coach. I am the host of the Second Phase podcast, and I'm also a headshot and branding photographer. I am mom to three, and I'm married to a really great guy, and I live in... Doylestown, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Philadelphia, but I grew up in the Midwest, so I am a Midwesterner at heart. Okay, <laughs> very good. No, that's excellent. Uh, see, how long have you been doing the branding side of things? Well, my very first client, so to give you just a little bit more background, I have a doctorate in pharmacy by degree. And almost 10 years ago, I decided to follow my passion and I became a photographer. And my very first client was a branding shoot. And I created all of her content for her website, her CD cover, things like that. And at that moment, I knew that that is exactly what I wanted to do. But of course, it took me a long time to really focus in on my niche and create that as a niche. Because 10 years ago, branding wasn't what it is today. We didn't have Instagram. We didn't have the influencers. And so I kind of took the long route. And about three and a half, four years ago, maybe even five years ago, I really started seeing how so many of my clients had no idea how to build a personal brand and what that meant or what it took to really represent themselves online. And so I dove deep into learning more and more about branding in general and um, did a complete rebrand for myself. And from there, that's where my focus has primarily been. I think a lot of times when people think of branding, they immediately think, like you said, a redesign, right? That includes graphics and new logo and just the pretty, the outward appearance. Um, and I know from based on listening to your content and reading different articles that you have, that you believe it's really about that personal branding and that voice that goes into it. Mm-hmm. One of the pieces that I really want to dive into today is your niche? Because I think so many people just assume that personal brand, oh, it's me. I can just put out there whatever I want, whatever I'm passionate about. And often that can leave them just one in a million. It doesn't let them stand out because they're not really defining themselves. So let's start off. How would you define what a niche means? To me, a niche is when you have a focus. You have one or two things that you really, that's what you do. That's what you're the most passionate about. That's what really lights you up. And that's the the thing that you can do to better serve your audience. So it's, you know, in, instead of having 10 things, 
And you can be multi-passionate and still have a niche. Um, you can, you know, within a niche, you can be multi-passionate, but it's, it's really having that one service that you provide that everybody knows you're the expert at, you're the authority in that space. So it really comes down to just being that, to being the expert and the authority on that one thing that serves your audience. Yes, absolutely. And I think when it comes to that, it can often feel like you are multi-passionate, but how do you really figure out what that's going to be? So how does someone find their niche? I think it's so easy to talk about, oh, you need to be niche. You need to know what you're going to do. And then when you look at yourself, it's often, I think, hard for us. We're so close to it that we often don't know what our gift is in. So Mm -hmm. how would someone find their niche? Well, another thing, something that just you said kind of of triggered this thought. And a lot of times people are afraid to even think about niching down because they're afraid they're going to limit themselves or decrease their revenue. But like you said, it, it can be very overwhelming to think of it that way. And then it, you know, the fear component comes in as well. But what I always tell my clients is let's take a deep dive into what are your values, what are your visions, and what are your passions? And those three things combined are going to align somewhere. They're going to mirror each other in some way, shape, or form. And it doesn't mean you only can do one thing. What that means is that those three things that you really focus on are going to, you know, your values, visions, your passions, when you're doing something that aligns with those three things, you're going to feel fulfilled. You're going to feel joy. You're going to be at peace and you're going to have that sense of, you know, empowerment for not only yourself, but for those that you're serving. Yes. Oh, I cannot agree more because I think it does that sense that you said of just content and happy and doing joyful in what you are doing is so important. I think because a lot of people will think, well, I don't want to work for the man for that nine to five corporate job. I want to work for myself. I want to be an entrepreneur. And they assume that working for themselves is going to be so easy. They're going to be able to figure it out, make their own schedule. And it honestly isn't for the faint of heart. You have to really truly believe in what you are doing because in the beginning, let's be honest, you're building to be able to monetize and grow it as a business even stronger. Um, So when we're looking at that for that piece, how do we determine if that niche is profitable and can be a business? Because I think that that's the piece. Someone can say, oh, I'm so passionate about this, but how is that going to be profitable to be a business? So I think that anyone could take anything and make it a business. You know, if you if you have a hobby or you have something you're passionate about and it aligns with your values and your visions, and that's where it becomes so, so important is that your vis- your values are that whatever you're going to do, whatever you want to do, whatever hobby it is, whatever you're passionate about, make sure it aligns with your values. And then you can make it a success because what happens sometimes is people will think, oh, I can make a business out of this. And they go into it with that mindset of, I'm I'm doing this to make money. But when you incorporate your values, you come from a place of service. You come from a place that is genuinely authentic and wanting to serve and empower other people. And that's where we get more success. And, you know, one thing that I say too is you can do a poll, ask your friends, ask your family, Ask your followers on social media, would they have an interest in whatever this is that you are going to create, whatever you can do to serve other people? And you're going to have a good feeling when you do that as to whether or not this is has potential to succeed or not. But I think if you have the energy to focus and you put forth that the energy within whatever it is you want to do and you stay true to your values and authentic self, you can make it a success and make it profitable. I love that you talked about testing it, right? Because a lot of times we just assume I'm going to make this product, I'm going to put it out there and I'm going to build it and they're all going to come, right? It's that field of dreams kind of feeling. And 
that's just not the way it works. You can't make an airplane in the air. Uh, one of the books that I absolutely love that I think really helped me understand this better and how I could determine if the people that I were asking about whether or not they would purchase that product or service would want it was Pat Flynn's Will It Fly. He mm-hmm. talks about that idea of you need to test, ask as many people as you can, and then also offer it and see if people are willing to pay for it. Because there's a difference, I truly believe, between some asking someone, would you want this? And would you pay for it? And are you willing to put your money where your mouth is? So I really, truly I agree 100% that you do. You have to test it. You have to know whether or not people are truly going to want that and be interested in it and are going to continue to follow along with what you're doing as you grow. Absolutely. I agree 100%. And I think it's important to keep in mind too that you may have this idea or you may have this thing that you can create or an idea of how you can serve people, but you might have to pivot a little bit. Like maybe, yes, they want this, but they're only going to pay for it if it is like this. And so, you know, there are so many times when our ideas, and and I think that's really important to note is we have to be somewhat flexible. We can't be so rigid within our niche that this is the only thing we're going to provide. This is the only way we're going to serve other people. And I like to think about it as almost like an hourglass where you have, you know, you have all of these ideas at the top and you want to do all of these things, but you can't, we cannot do everything for everyone. So we can narrow that down and really master whatever that focus is. And then we can spread back out. So that's where that multi-passionate person can come in. And what I always suggest is that if you are a multi-passionate person, like maybe you are a therapist, but you're also a master networker and you want to have a networking organization on the side, you can do that. But think about who you are as the person, because it's your personality, your influence that's really going to make both of those items, or maybe there's more items than two, um, be successful. And that's going to be infusing, you know, your personality into whatever it is you're doing. So maybe, maybe your brand becomes you. And then you have, you know, you as the therapist, you as the networking organization, even if they're different names, you are still the head of that organization. And so, you know, that's how you then make those emotional connections and, and stay true to your focus and becoming an authority. You can be an authority in multiple spaces, but you are the authority. Whether you're a seasoned podcaster or just thinking of starting a podcast, you need to listen to Buzzcast from the folks at Buzzsprout. Here we go. Buzzcast covers everything a podcaster should know from marketing strategies and how to make money from your podcast to the latest and greatest tech and industry insights to keep you on the cutting edge. Follow Buzzcast by clicking the link in the description or go to buzzcast.buzzsprout.com and keep podcasting. I think it's interesting that you use the word pivot because I think I've done quite a few pivots throughout my time as a lifestyle blogger, well, even before when I was a teacher and then a lifestyle blogger. And then even within my coaching business that I've now had for three, three years at this point that I've pivoted the type of client that I'm looking to work with, or I've pivoted based on who I can see I can serve the best. So I think sometimes what happens is, is we go into it attracting a wider array, and then we realize our values and our purpose, and we start to kind of pivot a little bit, but the people that we've already attracted may not be the right people. So now it's almost like we're starting 
not necessarily over because probably some of them are within there, but we are definitely niching down and getting into the specific people that we truly want to work with. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I have clients that will come to me and they have had great success with their being an influencer or working on uh, sponsored content, whatever it might be. And then they'll decide, I want to actually build a course that's a little bit, and that's much, that's narrower. So mm-hmm. when we're looking at that side of things, their whole audience that they have had hasn't necessarily been the right per, exact people for that. And being okay with, you have to grow it the same way you grew all of this other audience for the past, however many years they had been in business doing that. Mm-hmm. I just think it's so interesting because it does, it changes. It changes based on what we're seeing. We attract people for and our, what we can handle, our purpose, uh, I think changes too. Yeah. Uh, So yes. Yeah, I agree. I think we definitely, you know, as we age, as circumstances in our life change, we change. And so, so does our ideal audience because, you know, we may think that we want to focus in one area, but we, as we change and as we grow, and become, you know, better business women or, um, you know, just different shifts in our values as we age, whatever that case may be, the people that we're working with, some, they could have been the best clients ever for years, but then all of a sudden we've shifted and now they're frustrating to work with. And why does that happen? Well, it happens because our values and our visions for ourselves change our passions change over time and I think that's why it's 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 great and incredible to niche down because you can really hone in on your um, ideal audience to start with so that you can grow and become profitable but once you achieve that state I don't think there's ever anything wrong with reevaluating you know am I on the right path am I still being fulfilled and fueled? Do I still have the energy and passion that I had when I started? And if not, maybe it is because you still want to do what you're doing. You're still the authority and the expert, but maybe the the ideal client has shifted and maybe you now want to take them. And if you think about it, I like to think about it as this, you know, if you're a coach, you can, you're, you have the experience to coach anyone who's 10 steps behind you, right? So as we're moving forward, we're, we're growing. And so maybe those people are staying 10 steps behind us instead of, or they're, you know, 20 steps behind us now instead of 10 steps. And so, you know, you think about it, just walking down the road and somebody's in front of the other person. And, you know, that person can always turn back and say, now watch your step. There was this pebble in the road and you could trip. Those, those experiences are going to shift and change. Therefore, the people behind us that we have influence over or can influence or help or serve is going to shift as well. I love that. So how would someone determine if they need to narrow down their niche? Uh, Almost, I'm thinking too, when answering this question, if looking at it as possibly an example, you might be able to give of like a a specific industry and how they were maybe able to narrow it down a little bit more to um, get it to a successful place where they were looking to do with their business. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. So let's, let's look at it as um, let's use a photographer as an example, because this is a pretty easy, concrete example. Um, If you are a photographer, you have, a plethora of options that you could do. You could, you could do weddings, you could do family portraiture, you could do boudoir, you could do headshots and branding like I do. A lot of times when people start out, they do everything and they take every job that comes their way. And some of those jobs fulfill them and make them happy. And they love working with those clients and other jobs they don't like at all. So, for example, a a photographer that I coached, she is now a boudoir photographer. But when she first started, she was taking every job that came her way. Now she's an authority in that boudoir space where she's creating incredible images for women to give to their significant others or um, just to feel empowered that, you know, they 
they don't like looking at themselves in the mirror, but she can create these gorgeous images of them. And then they, their confidence blossoms. And so she, her confidence grows every time she works with these people to see their confidence grow. So that's, you know, she, she can still do like take on weddings once in a while because the, the boudoir person is now getting married and wants to give this gift to her future husband. And, you know, you can see how it kind of builds, but it took her experiencing everything to really find what she loved the most and where she really wanted to invest her time, her energy and her marketing too. Yes. Cause that and, becomes a huge piece of it is the marketing side. So you can attract those people. It's mm-hmm. going to be different than the one that's looking for the newborn photo shots or the wet. Well, maybe yes. they'll work for boudoir, but Infant shots, that's not going to be the same no. woman that's going to want a boudoir shot. No, that would be like me doing newborn photography. I have no desire to do that. I That would just be so stressful. Whereas I love connecting with women, creating a headshot for them that they can be proud to use, that's going to get them, you know, make great online introduction for them and boost their career. Like that is where I get fueled and excited. But I also like that the um, conversation that I get to have when I'm working with those women to have parents hovering over me while I'm trying to work would just stress me out. So you can kind of see just, and those are, I think photographer is a great example from the perspective. It can be so black and white in terms of finding your niche and narrowing down your scope, but it's also um, not, maybe not quite as realistic as someone who, who is a coach. But I think at the same time, you can take a look at that and realize like, okay, do I want to coach women in service industries or do I want to coach women in corporate or do I want to coach women who are therapists? You know, so you can really take a look at who, who is it you want to work with. And that's where identifying your niche is so important because if you don't have a niche, you don't realize what you, where your values, visions, and passions align you aren't creating content and messaging that's going to reach your ideal audience. So you really truly have to be clear who you work with or, or what you do, how you do it, your why, and then who it is that you want to work with so that you can effectively communicate with them. And so that they can have clarity in your messaging and understand that you are the person for them. Right. As you're talking, I'm thinking about, I have this picture in the back of my head of my food blogger audience that I know so many of them come in thinking I'm going to do gluten-free. I'm going to do um, vegan. I'm going to create just healthy recipes. I'm going to create comfort food. And they feel that that is niching down and they're so used to, and I'm totally calling them out right now. And I'm, I have a couple of clients in my head as I'm doing this and they may probably roll their eyes as they're listening to this, but they think of the way in which they come into monetizing is for ads coming for people clicking through to get their recipe. And that's how they started out making their ad money. And now with the way that we're seeing things, COVID switching and wanting to think about diversifying, they're thinking, what product service can I offer? Well, I'm going to teach them how to do meal planning, or I'm going to teach them how to eat a particular way or whatever that might be. And they don't see the same amount of traffic, the same amount of results as quickly because it has niched down from being a vegan food blog to now putting together a meal plan. It's a little something different. And I think that they get frustrated and feel like they can't do it. And they always fall back to that. I'm just going to do healthy recipes and it's just, I'm going to have the ad money, but it's a journey. It's something that you have to step into and start to draw in that audience that is going to want the product and service. Because out of the audience that you have, you may have 5,000 followers on Instagram. Maybe only a hundred of them are going to be interested in your course or product. Just need to continue to attract them and talk about the product and service and talk about the values that you have and why this is so important to you so that you can draw them in. And I know I totally went off on a tangent, (laughs) but as you're talking about this and giving the photographer example, it was, I could just all of my food blogging audience that I know is listening. I definitely can see them being able to do this as well. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, you said something about they make a change, they add a product and they don't get the response that they're looking for. Well, a lot of time that's 
a lot of times that's because their message isn't resonating, right? Like you really have to communicate if you're, if you're pivoting outside of your niche a little bit or adding something to your niche portfolio, you really have to communicate that effectively. So you can add to your brand, but then the key is when you're adding to your brand, you market it strategically by using great communication skills. Yes. And I definitely think that that is a part of the problem. And I can see that within my own coaching business. As I pivoted, it was definitely, it wasn't this just, I'm click my, you know, snap my fingers and all of a sudden I'm offering this service and everybody's just going to jump on board and want to do that. I had to explain, like you said, and communicate what it was they were going to get from this added um, product or service that I was adding in as part of my brand. So mm-hmm. I love that. So smart. What, what, what is the best way to find out if the niche they chose is the right fit? How do you think you determine that? I think it's actually really simple. Are you feel, are you feeling fulfilled when you work with your clients? Do you feel a sense of joy at the end of the day? that you have impacted someone else's life in a positive way and empowered yourself or positively influenced your life in some way at the end of the day? And do you feel at peace? Like, do you feel content with what you're doing? And if you don't, if you feel, you know, that itchy feeling like, oh, well, maybe, maybe I missed the boat here, or maybe I should be doing this, or maybe I should add this, then you're not where you're meant to be. And you just need to sit with it a little bit. Like I am, I am a huge person of faith. Like I, my faith is like really key for me. So for me, I would sit with it, pray about it, and then kind of, you know, let that be my guiding light. But whatever you believe in, just sit with it. If you, if you meditate, meditate on it for a little bit and you're going to find the answers. But so much of it is that if you're not feeling completely confident and at peace in what you're doing every day, all day long, you're not, something's missing or you need to pivot a little bit. And we're probably overusing that word pivot today, but you need to make a change. You need to, you know, go around the corner and evaluate, you know, maybe, maybe it's the people you're working with that you're not reaching the right people and that's causing you frustration. Or maybe it's just, you're not quite on the right path. You're close, but you're not quite where you want to be yet. And so that's why you're feeling that way. But you have to really then think about, okay, which direction felt really good. And to me, making lists is so powerful, you know, make a list of those things that you do that make you feel really great and then make a list of those things that don't make you feel so great and then scratch those off, you know, move them outside of your, your business realm and focus on those things that really did make you feel good about what you were doing. Yes. And I think when it comes easily, that's normally a sign that it's the right thing. For me, if I can talk about a topic for at least 30 minutes straight without stopping, that to me is definitely something that is comes easily and I'm passionate about it and I'm probably going to sound like I'm up on my soapbox about it. But that tells me that's going to connect with my audience because they can feel that. They know that that's that authentic self sharing and showing exactly what you believe and how you do have a solution to fix the problem that they have. Mm-hmm. So, And what you just said is so key because I'm the same way. I get so excited and so passionate anytime I'm talking about personal branding and or photography, whatever. But um, if you don't have that passion and if, if you don't have energy with what you're doing and when you communicate what you do, people aren't going to make that emotional connection with you and you're not going to be able to build the relationships that you need to build in order to produce a profitable, successful business. So really focus on those emotions that you're feeling while you're working within your business to make sure that your, your brand and your, your niche are, are on the right track. Yes, I totally agree. Uh, Robin, where are the best places to connect with you? Because I could continue this conversation, I think, at least for another 45 minutes. But we are, I just looked up at the time, like, oh my goodness, we're at 30 minutes already. Um, So where are the best places to connect? The best place is probably my website. Everything is there. It's therobingraham.com. There um, 
I have a Facebook group as well, which is awesome. And it's called the Brand Marketing Insider. So we have tips and trainings and, you know, just have a lot of fun in there. I like to say we make branding fun. And um, then on Instagram is the Robin Graham. I'm pretty much the Robin Graham on every platform, Pinterest as well. But I would, I definitely would love to invite all of your listeners to join the Facebook group, the Brand Marketing Insider, if they have any questions related to niching down, building a personal brand, um, going from phase one to phase two. And then my podcast, obviously, is the second phase podcast. Yes. And I think my audience will definitely also resonate with your podcast because a lot of them, their their businesses are the second phase. So I think that that's definitely a great connection for them, for sure. Well, Robin, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate you so much. Thank you, Jenny. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Well, there you have it. I clearly could have continued to talk to Robin the rest of the day about this. I just think that this is such a huge mistake that so many bloggers and influencers make when they come to creating their content and overall just creating their business. They go in just assuming that they can create what they're passionate about, which is fine. But if you're going to diversify your income and start making a product or service, you need to niche down into that and become known as that expert. And something I need you to realize is that it takes time. I don't care if you've been blogging for 10 years. If you've been a food blogger for 10 years and you've been doing healthy recipes for people, they're not used to you defining yourself as an expert in freezer meal planning, let's say, for example. So it's going to take time to build that. You have to continually talk to them and communicate about that. So niching down is something that is going to benefit you because it does allow you to create that product or service. But at the same time, you're going to have to grow that side of your audience. And the audience that you do have, you're going to need to communicate that you are shifting a little bit. Many of you who have been with me from the beginning of this podcast, which is now three years, has noticed that I have pivoted. I have niched down. I have made sure that I try to attract my ideal client. And that has pivoted and that has shifted and that's okay, but it takes time to build it. It doesn't happen overnight. You guys, I really truly want you to make sure that you take this to heart and decide how you can move your business forward with it. Niche down, really become known as the expert in that particular field. As always, I appreciate you guys so much when you take the time to leave a rating room and review on your favorite podcasting app. It helps so much to be able to bring great content to you based on those reviews and ratings. If you are walking your dog or if you are out just driving along, take a screenshot and put it up on your Instagram stories. You can tag me at Jenny underscore Melrose and I'd love to know your biggest takeaway from this episode. All right, guys, until next time, I will see you all then. 